Okay? Okay, good. So, um, a lot has been discussed already about the role of social media in the revolutions, so much that at times it gets frustrating to continue going over the same discussions over and over again. So I would like to uh, raise the question of where are we right now when it comes to the tension between citizens and governments online. Okay. So I think at this point we are living a moment of a certain degree of maturity of digital activism, of maturity of the way citizens in repressive contexts are using the tools at their disposal to find new ways for organization, for communication, but also regimes have also learned a lot over the past years on how to deal with this activity of people online, on how to tackle, on how to follow, on how to surveil citizens on the same spaces where we can find new room for freedom. So I'd like to see a few cases. First of all, we are at a context when it comes to the area that I know uh, the best, which is the Middle East and, uh, and uh, North Africa. We have seen unprecedented brutality coming mainly from the institutions, from the governments. We have been suffering decades of government-owned media. We have been facing the fact that journalists were banned in countries like Syria and Bahrain. So no international press can go there and cover what's happening independently. And we have seen as a counter, uh, as a reaction to these monopolies, we have recently seen an evolution of video activism, especially, and in general, an evolution in the use of tools to share and organize from citizens. And we have also evolved into some sort of propaganda war where now everybody's trying to use the internet to spread and disseminate their own messages. Within this context, I think one of the uh, best examples I've seen recently of uh, maturity of the use of technology for activism and uh, social movements, I would say is the people of Kuwait. Okay. Kuwait is one of the smallest countries with the biggest percentage of oil in the world. So it has very good relationships with the West. It is obviously not an open, repressive regime like the Syrian or Bahraini one. There's obviously a large amount of differences, but also there is a certain and growing sense of disconnection between government and the citizens. And citizens have engaged in historic demonstrations over the past weeks, over the past month, historic demonstrations mainly organized through social media, especially using Twitter in an extremely efficient and effective way. Everything from the colors that activists were going to wear as a symbol, as a unified symbol of the demonstrations. From that to the specific dates and venues of the protests, all of this was decided and organized and shared through Twitter, while mainstream media in Kuwait and in other places did not really cover these historic demonstrations. And this shows the huge divide between old and new, between traditional and more modern ways of communication and organizing, mainly led by the youth of these countries. Another example of the very efficient and mature use of technology for social change purposes is Saudi Arabia. So we have this campaign by women that's called Women to Drive, where women are challenging the prohibition. There's a fatwa in Saudi Arabia that forbids women for driving. It's the only country, the only country in the world where women cannot drive. And it's not because of a law, it's because of a fatwa of a religious law, 
market. So now women are challenging this, are recording themselves driving and posting this to YouTube, and it's a movement that's growing and it's growing and it's growing. On the other hand, we have this new electronic system to uh, report on women and people under 21 years old when they leave the country. So every time a Saudi woman, a Saudi woman goes to Bahrain to study at the university, her husband or father, her guardian, receives a message, a very uh, efficient device that uh, automatically shares with the guardian where this woman is going because they're banned from leaving the country without authorization. And this has opened a new, uh, a stronger debate on the issue of women's rights. And it's all related to the increasing visibility these issues have thanks to the tools at our disposal as citizens. Maybe the most dramatic case is Syria, and I'll leave this video. These are Syrian, this is a Syrian demonstration for like a month ago, where Syrians are saying, well, we want freedom, we want a Syria for all Syrians, and they're screaming this. And I don't know if you notice anything on this video. Is there anything that calls your attention from this video? No, but that's very normal in a in a in an Arab country. Yes. What is not normal? Sorry. No, I mean this is very common. We can we can discuss the issue of the veil. But right now, I mean these are activists, you men and women. Faces. Exactly. So you don't see the faces. This is an evolution. This is a proof of the evolution in activism. Okay. In the first videos of the first demonstrations in the Middle East and North Africa, you saw a lot of faces. But this has backfired because it's very good to show abuses, to make them visible through social media, but at the same time, you give these governments very useful, very juicy information that they would not easily have if you did not serve it to them through social media, through YouTube videos. So now we see a lot of banners explaining the day, the time, the place, to give context to journalists and people who want to understand what's happening, where and when. And you also see that people try not to show their faces. And this is so important and so crucial that there are people working in technologies like there's a, a, a software by witness.org and The Guardian, there's a software that comes with Android mobile phones that you can download to blur the faces automatically. So you are recording a demonstration and the telephone automatically blurs the faces, okay? So this is all a proof of the growing needs for protection of identity, of privacy, and also on the ways the community is trying to respond to government surveillance and attacks. So, um, the surveillance and the attacks of the governments have uh, reached the point of complete blackout in certain cases. We saw this with Egypt in January 28th to January 29, when Egypt in 2011 was completely disconnected off the internet. So Egypt, the whole country was offline for, uh, for a few hours, two days, completely disconnected. And now we are seeing that the Syrian regime is doing the same. There's been partial attempts to disconnect the country, but it's never been complete disconnection. This graphic shows the drop in internet traffic from 10 in the morning to 10.30 in the morning. Do you see the difference? I mean, do you see this? This is, this is huge and this is unprecedented to completely disconnect a country. Why is this dangerous? Is this dangerous because, because uh, we want people to be posting photos on Facebook? Why is this so dangerous? Because some of my friends were saying, well, people are dying and we're worrying about the internet. Why am I so worried about this? Yes? Because um, it's a way actually of uh, holding the government and the, and the police accountable to their deeds. So it's a, a way of sort of protecting those democracies. Good. And, uh, 
Mm, he's saying that it prevents government from being accountable? Yes, yes, it's like that. So governments tend to commit the worst crimes, the worst abuses when nobody's watching, when nobody can tell what's happening. So imagine what this kind of regime can do when nobody's watching, when there are no witnesses. That is why we are terrified about what they can do behind closed doors after everything we've seen when the whole world was watching. So we are terrified for our families at a time where we cannot communicate with them and know if they're safe or not. So another proof of the huge divide between traditional structures and new structures and media is that this was huge online. So everybody was sharing internet cut in Syria, Syria blackout on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google, on blogs. I didn't see a single traditional house outlet yesterday talking about this. Not in a uh, TV news. I didn't see any TV news anchor. I didn't see any traditional newspaper talking about this. And it was huge online. So this is a proof of the disconnection between things that matter to netizens in real lifetime and how behind traditional media are. So the question that I pose, and maybe we can discuss, is for activists showing their identities and also recording what's happening in real lifetime in contexts like Syria and Bahrain is a huge risk. It's a huge risk. So is this risk worth it? Because we tend to see that the more videos we see coming out of places like Syria, like Bahrain, they're not having an impact on public opinion anymore. They're not producing a reaction to these massacres. People tend to get numb by too many videos. So, uh, so the question is, how can we uh, improve the connection between this news that activists are producing and the impact on the public opinion, on the international community, so that this risk is worth the time. And now, to end this, I would like to uh, show you an example of how I'm using social media for a particular initiative that I would like to invite you to contribute to. This is a crowdfunding campaign uh, to collect money for a hospital inside Syria and uh, we're trying to build a hospital in the liberated area right now. And I would like you all to see it, and if you like it, to share it and help us uh, get to the minimum that we need to have this hospital up and running. And I think this is one of the best uses we can make of digital tools. I'm very excited about this campaign. So I would like to share it with you. And with this, I will be done, Jordi. Okay. But we, do we have sound? Leila Nashawati. I'm a Spanish of uh, Syrian descent and I've been uh, following uh, events in Syria since uh, the beginning of the uprisings and uh, the brutality with which uh, the regime has uh, responded. At this point there is virtually no family that has not been affected but uh, the situation of those displaced inside Syria is particularly dramatic. So I would like to ask for your help with uh, an initiative that the Union of Syrians Abroad is putting together, which is a hospital specialized in orthopedic surgery. It's actually the first hospital specializing in orthopedic surgery to uh, help those uh, who have been injured and have suffered amputations. If you have uh, seen the images uh, coming out of Syria and you have been or horrified like we have been and you have 
maybe wondered what you can do to help. Here's uh, one initiative um, to help those uh, who need it uh, the most. So uh, with your help and support, we will hopefully have uh, the hospital up and running uh, very soon. So uh, thank you. Goteo.org, you can see uh, at the home of the site, you can see the project. And if you follow me on Leila underscore NA, you can also see more information. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today.